We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for the unbiased UFO report. The man known as Fedora John, John Hudson, is here to hang on out and tell us the latest news. And John, we're going to start off with the two of the Stars Academy making a little bit of headline news again. That's Tom DeLong's group. After a report from the Black Vault's John Greenwald, fill us in. Well, first off, um, thanks for everyone uh, sticking around. It's, it's great to see you all. Um, and once again, hats off to uh, to John Greenwald for his, his great work. And uh, the rather amusing part of this, at least in my opinion, is that the T- TTSA's um, part in this is actually the absence of news rather than it is their contribute their, their contribution to news um essentially you know a lot of you know the story of the of the army uh, uh crater and uh essentially this is a, a joint in, um, agreement between ttsa and the army to use ttsa labs to investigate parts that that uh, ttsa had collected ttsa has been completely quiet on this front um they they will mention a little bit in their uh, in their um, investor relation, that's about it. Uh, Mr. Greenwald uh, was able to get through a um, Freedom of Information Act um, information, as well as through just talking to the Army, who evidently was quite willing to share information, uh, unlike uh, some others. And the Army was very politely and said, "No, actually, we've completed much of that testing. Um, you know, at least initial testing. It, the project goes on." And uh, and he even found a um, a, a report from through an F- FOIA that basically said that not only was it moving forward, but they had a schedule, and the, the DoD had uh, DDPR our office had requested that they take over, um, you know, communication for it. Now the quick funny side note is is that now the DoD claims that they didn't ever make that request, but what we have here is we have the Army being forthcoming, and we have TT- TTSA saying. No comment. But that is so typical of Tom DeLong and his group. I mean, this is where I have issues with the two, the Stars Academy. When they held the Pressless Press Conference back in on October 10th of 2017, they were talking about everything being transparent, everything going in front of the public, everything's going to be upfront. And it's been secret after secret after secret after secret. Why should we even pay attention to Tom DeLong's To The Stars Academy anymore? Yeah, it's it's super challenging. And you know the, the problem that I have is that I come from the startup world. I've been involved in six startups. I might be joining my seventh. And I understand that usually your first three years, three years or so, you're usually in what's called stealth mode. You don't say anything because honestly, you don't really know if you're going to make it or not. And so, and your plans might change. Unfortunately, TTSA didn't follow this rule and they tried to come out and make press in the beginning. But realistically, a lot of times there isn't much they can say because of where they are. And so I understand part of it. But the problem is, is that they're, they're very schizophrenic about it as far as when they do release information and when they don't. And when you have a situation where the army is being more forthcoming than you are about something, then you're you're probably treading into some pretty dangerous territory. Tom DeLong hasn't done anything, anything, since Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and Steve Justice left the To the Stars Academy. He hasn't made a he made a, a re- really strange formal announcement about their resignations recently. He was on a podcast with Jim Semivan and and himself. You know. Uh, which they really said nothing once again. I think the UFO community and the public at large 
especially those who are investors, have lost a lot of faith in the TTSA. And should they even be in the news anymore? Or is this project done and hanging on by just, you know, an oxygen tank here? Well, I, I think that they've, look, most places reach this point, and TTSA did a long time ago. You get to a point where you only talk about what you're doing. You only talk about what you can show. You've lost trust, and you can no longer talk about what you haven't done yet. And they reached that point a while ago. And so as far as I'm concerned, if Tom wants to talk about the movies he's working on, if he wants to talk about books that are coming out, if he wants to talk about any of the media aspect of what he's doing, which, let's face it, is all he has to focus on now and what he's probably good at, much less the other stuff. If he wants to talk about that, I'm all for it. But um, I, I would argue that the rest of it, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's probably best to just focus on what you can really do. No, and I understand that. But it's always been a, what if I told you? Would you believe it if I told you? Sorry, I have no faith in the man. I think his story is BS from how the TTSA got started. I think it's BS that they cried for transparency about UFOs, and then they did the exact opposite, screwing the public, screwing their investors. All right? I, yeah, I think I mean, it's, I, 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 oh, go ahead. I'm not a fan of the organization. I really am not. Yeah, now, I, that being said, I'm a big fan of Lou Elizondo, and Chris Mellon in their work, but for Tom DeLong and his organization, not there, not there. I think it's well, a complete I, failure. I will, I will just differ with you in this one aspect, and that is that that I was involved in TTSA very early, and and I and I I will admit I'm one of the people that bought a very very small number of shares, and the entire game plan was to raise fifty million dollars out of the IPO off, out of the stock offering. Right? If they had raised that money. I think things would have played out incredibly differently. I think as soon as they only raised $2 million, they were now in a really bad spot. They then tried to raise money from the government. That failed as well. As soon as that failed, they were in deep trouble. And, that, and when a startup gets into that position, they make compromises. They change strategy. They make deals with people they wouldn't normally make with. And honestly, I've seen this happen in in a lot of places before that had nothing to do with UFOs. And so I agree with you. The state we're in now is not nice. Yeah, but but that, I think that the way we got here is perhaps a little more organic. You know what? We're going to have to debate this on one of our after party shows because I think a lot of it, we're on the same page. We're just coming at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. And, you know... I think the the TTSA is a joke. I've I've never been uh, supported supportive of it. I've never asked my listeners to support it. Could never get behind it. Too many lies. Too much deceit. And when you come out in your first press conference and say you are going to be the public watchdog to UFOs because these things are happening, and then the first thing you start doing is playing games like they did in that opening press conference with no media there. It is a complete joke, and I don't think that any respect has to do with that. Learning what I know from what was happening behind the scenes as to why there was no media coverage or anything along those lines, it really makes sense that this is a complete failure, you know, complete failure. I would and agree that, there. And that's totally what it is. There. That's what it is. All right, let's move on to topic number two because we're going to go to Stanford University where there's a very – very top-notch scientists that the public will know the names of looking into some debris yeah so this is this is a this is a really interesting um change uh, uh, i should say event that's occurred because essentially um what is happening is not all that different from what we learned in james fox's movie okay this is talking about the um the equipment that they now have at stanford which is um, essentially a multi-parameter ion beam imager, okay? This is a multi-million dollar piece of equipment that is quite unique to Stanford. And this allows them to look at things at the subatomic level, okay? Which is not something we've been able to do or at least do in most places uh, up till recently. And so basically this allows Dr. Gary Nolan uh, who works at Stanford as far as, and, and Jacques Vallée, who, who has a relationship with Stanford to essentially take the bits that, that Vallée has been collecting and 
analyze them underneath this this new uh, this new microscope. But what's interesting is for some reason, and I don't know what happened, but for some reason, this suddenly tripped up just in the last couple of days. And uh, no less than at least three different places are all reporting this at this as the point from science news to the mirror in the UK to, uh, you know, a, a, a more nerdy site called giant freaking robot. I mean, basically suddenly this story is catching fire all over the place. And I understand why it's catching fire. To me, it's a very interesting story because what they're talking about is being able to modify isotopes, being able to actually change the number of neutrons that you have so that you actually end up with a different isotope of a, um, you know, of, of a fundamental, you know, aspect of, of, of you know, the t we do atomic, but this is subatomic. This is a very different scale of, of engineering. And if they can prove that, that's a big deal. So I get the excitement. I don't understand why it's popped up now. The amount of knowledge that both Jacques Vallée and Gary Nolan have in this field where most of their own studying and work at Stanford is revolving around the study of UFOs and, and the technology behind them. Do you believe that they are getting any closer to trying to find at least some, some minor answers to what this metamaterials are? Uh, so, Okay, so what, what I'm about to say is based on a small amount of information. Okay, I'll, I'll admit that up front. But it's my personal opinion at this point that they are much further along than they're admitting. And that what's really going on is that they're having to pick and choose what papers they put out first. Because going through peer review, um, you know, what's involved. I mean, basically what, what, uh, what Nolan explained to us at one point was it was about $500,000 per uh, category of experiment. And so my understanding is in the beginning, Nolan was looking at experiencers, specifically looking at that 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 antenna concept in the brain, and that the the analysis of parts would come a little bit later. Ever since James Fox's film came out, we've seen that they're paying more attention to it. But my experience with Dr. Gary Nolan uh, and Jacques Vallée is that they do a lot of work before they talk. And so my guess is is that they've already seen that because basically what what Gary Nolan's quote uh, came down to was that he said, we build our world with 80 elements. Someone else is building the world with 253 different isotopes. That was a direct quote from Gary Nolan. And that shows that he actually knows what he's looking at now. And he's seen what he's seen. And now it's just a matter of, of getting it formally written up and going through peer review. I like Drew's comment here. Normally, we don't bring audience comments into this. But he says, scientists deep inside the program program in quotation marks, know exactly what the metamaterials are. They have had 75 years to study it. Do you think that comes into play? Um, to a degree, but here's the thing. You can you can look at something and you can think, look, like this, this is clearly carbon, but it's behaving differently. So therefore, I can infer from that that it's perhaps a different isotope of carbon. But if I can't actually look at it at that level and verify that, you know, maybe I can verify it through other in, in, inferred means, but the, my point is, is that this ability to actually see it with a with an actual scope, that is, you know, that is at least new to the to the to the white world, and I think that I think that you have there's likely some progress, but I think ultimately, like what you saw in um, in Ross Colhart's book, um, there's still. They, they might be able to see the samples. They might be able to have some gleaning of what they do and how they and how they were built. But as far as being able to replicate that, I I I don't know. I, I'm I'm really I'm really in the unknown zone right now as far as whether they can actually replicate it. All right. Do we know where this meta material came from? Yes. Yeah, so this specific um, this specific case that they're talking about in most of these articles is a, a sample that came from Africa. But um, if you go, if you if you look at the, um, and there's pictures online as well, if you look at um, Jacques Ray's uh, uh, stack of, of components, he has like a stack of like three different small colored canisters. And each one of those canisters has a different sample in it. This is basically Jacques' personal collection. This is what he's been carrying around with him for years, adding to it everywhere he goes. So, so it's and it's and it's completely separate than what TTSA had or what the Army's testing. 
This is Jacques Vallée's, you know, personal stash. And so, um, but my understanding is that the, the, the parts that they're specifically talking about in most of these articles is, is, the, is some parts that were recovered in Africa. Hmm. Well, that, uh, that really hits the nail on the head, my friend really hits the nail on the head for what they are working on. I hope they're able to come up with some sort of solution. How does this, uh, this will be my final question for you, as someone who do, really doesn't understand the, the scientific side of how this works, what are they trying to study with these materials? Is it about what are those materials made of, John, or where they came from? It, it's you. It's very, very hard to, to nothing comes with a made in here label. Right. So what you're doing is you're you're looking at how it's constructed. And if we can see that, look, someone built this by changing the number of neutrons of creating new isotopes of things and sticking those together to get a different behavior. And those are isotopes thing that we can't are not natural in on Earth. We don't know how to build. You can essentially infer with a tremendous amount of, of evidence that these materials were not built on this planet. And if they can show that in a, in a clear way in a paper and get that paper peer reviewed, what you will have is you will have a paper showing that there is someone manufacturing something intelligently and on purpose with specific needs and purposes that are not from Earth. Hmm. Well, we're going to have to leave it. We're, we're going to have to leave it right there, my friend John Hudson. Another great unbiased UFO report. We'll talk to you in a couple nights' time. We really do appreciate you coming on in and keeping us very much up to date. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Well, let's get to the news. Shirky Poo's got us all ready and roaring for tonight. <laughs> 